Jesus, I'm asking to make a way. Stir up hunger within us, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Stir up hunger, spiritual hunger. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's pray that God would stir our hunger for him tonight. Oh God, don't ever let us become satisfied with what we receive. There's something more, Lord. We need more. God, I pray. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Lord, we pray, Lord, for a hunger. Stir a hunger within us, O oh God. A hunger for more of you. Hallelujah. 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 And now, Lord, we repent of all of our sins, God. Every evil thought in our mind. Oh, God, we don't want to think those things again. Every evil word that we've spoken. Come on. Let's go into a time of repentance right now. Lord Jesus, search our heart for any ungodly thing. Forgive us, Lord, of all of our sin. Lord, I want you to purify our mind. Come on, lift your hands as a sign of surrender right now all across this room. Hallelujah. We all need to visit that altar of repentance. Father, I pray that you would sit revival. God, I long to be right with you. I want my heart to be right, my spirit, my focus to be right. I repent of all of my sins, God. I repent of it now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hand upon your mind, Lord. I pray right now that, Lord Jesus, you would take authority over my thoughts. God, let my mind be renewed in the Holy Ghost tonight. Change my thinking. I pray, Lord, that you would give me, Lord, the ability to, Lord, rightly divide, God, what I should do and what I shouldn't do, God. Hallelujah. I speak against anything, God, that would come against your spirit tonight, your word tonight. Hallelujah. I cast down every stronghold, every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of you. Lord Jesus, every high thing. I pray, Lord, that you would give me control of my mind. Let your kingdom come to my mind, Lord. And every part of us. Take authority in this service tonight. Lord, you know what needs to happen here. And Lord, I pray that your will would be done in everything that we do tonight. God, let your kingdom be established, your control be established in this service. God, we can't make it without you. Lord, take control. Take control, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take control of this house, Lord. Do a work here tonight. We thank you for it, Lord. God, I want you to bless the musicians and the singers. Come on, stretch your hands out right now, Lord. I want you to anoint them as they lead us in worship and praise, God. I want you to work through them, Lord. Hallelujah. God, bless the ushers and all those support staff and our, amen, here tonight. I pray that you would bless them, God. Let them receive what they need as well. God, our ministry translation, all of our online ministry. I pray, God, that your glory would rest in this house. Let tonight be a night of breakthrough, Lord. I pray, God, that somebody would receive healing in their body tonight. Hallelujah. If you need healing in your body, lift your hands to the Lord right now, and let's thank Him for it. Whatever you need, lift your hands and thank Him for it right now. Thank you, Lord. You're sending healing in this house. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do here tonight, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Amen. I, I know we've sang this song a few times. And I was just looking out across the crowd and I saw a lot of people clapping. I don't know if we just don't know the words. That one part was pretty simple, just joy. Amen. But look at your neighbor. I want somebody to shout joy. joy. Hallelujah. I want to know, is there anybody here that has the joy of the Lord in your life? Has God been good to us? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I, I'm just, I, I'm just, uh, I guess, uh, a little reminiscent right now, just kind of feeling a bit of nostalgia about that first time that God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And all of the pain of my past and the wondering and the worry and the anxiety and all of that suddenly was swallowed up in joy knowing that God had filled me with his spirit. Do you remember what it was like? Hallelujah. Do you remember what the, that baptism of joy was all about? That peace that passed understanding? Turn to somebody next to you and tell them, I've got the joy of the Lord inside. Come on. Why don't you sing it this time?
Hallelujah. Would you raise your hands with me for a moment, church? Would you bask in his presence right now? The sweet presence of God is in this place moving. Hallelujah. Touch our minds, God. Touch our hearts, Lord. Remind us, God, of the privilege, God, it is to be in your presence. Where you brought us from, God. What you saved us from, God. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. Worship God with me right now, church. Lord, I love you. I honor you, Lord. I praise you, Lord Jesus. You're worthy, God. You're worthy of worship and praise, honor and glory. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, God, I love you. And I praise you, Lord. I praise you, God. Oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Church, don't get in a rush right now. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, I cherish times like these, God, when your presence is moving. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Why don't you find somebody to pray with? Ladies with ladies, men with men. Hallelujah. Lord God, we need a stirring tonight, Lord. Oh, we need a stirring, God, of your mighty presence, of your spirit, Lord God. Hallelujah. I don't want to leave here the same way I came in, God. But if you're pulling and pushing, hallelujah, pull and push on my heart, Lord. Work on me. Mold me, God. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Jesus, I need more of you. You must increase, God. I must decrease, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, God. I come to give you the honor that's due unto you, Lord God. The worship that's due unto you, mighty Lord. Hallelujah. I praise you, God, for who you are. Who you are to me, Lord. You're my Savior. You're my Redeemer. You're my Liberator, God. You broke chains in my life of addiction. Hallelujah. Oh, of depression, Lord, of pain and suffering, God. You turn, turn my sorrow, hallelujah, into joy. My mourning into dancing, God, hallelujah. I worship you, hallelujah. Oh, I exalt you, I lift you up, God. I love you, Jesus, hallelujah. I praise you right now. Forget about what's going on around you and focus on the Lord right now with me, God. Hallelujah. I'm seeking you, God. My soul is thirsty for you, Lord. My soul is hungry for your touch, Lord. God, yes, God. Oh, we love you, God. We worship you. Clap your hands with me right now, church. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We praise you. We magnify you, God. You deserve the best. Hallelujah. The best that we can offer, Lord. The best that we can give. Hallelujah. Yesterday, we were at the TOR Kids Church, and the children's evangelist preached about the prodigal son, and He reminded me that when the prodigal son had taken all that he had and had spent it in the world and invested his time and his effort and his youth and his strength, and he was ended up with nothing, he was left with zero, he thought to himself, I could just go to my father's house. Why should I starve here? I could, my my father's servants have bread in their home, enough for everybody, enough to spare. And he thought, I'm just going to go to my father and I'm going to tell him, Father, look, I, I made mistakes. I spent all that, that you gave me. I, I ruined the family name, but I, just, just take me in as a servant and I'll serve you as a servant. I don't want to be a son. But before the son was able to finish, he was restored as a son, not a servant. That father could have rightfully said, yeah, you know what? You will be a servant. You'll serve me all the days of your life. But before that son was able to finish his great speech, That father restored him as a son. Many days we've invested in things and and stuff that 
that hasn't been beneficial to our soul or our walk with God. We've lost time and effort and, and wasted tears and suffering in the world. But God wants to restore us as his children. The Bible says not just as his children. He's given us a promise. He's given us his Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we're one step higher than angels. We're seeing and feeling the presence of the Lord moving in this place. But if we only knew who we truly were as, were as God's people, who we truly are as God's people, we would understand the power and the authority, the might that God has given, who we truly are, the promise that we have, the anointing, the power that dwells on our lives. Would you pray and worship God with me? God, thank you, God. You could have restored me as a servant, God, for all the things that I've done, but you said, no, a son. You will be a son to me again. Oh, thank you, mighty God. I worship you right now. I praise you right now. I love you. If you love God, would you clap your hands? And church, you can make, make a way back to your seat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Welcome to Sunday night Kaboom service. I know God has something special today. Yes, that's right. He is moving in a mighty way. We want to give you an opportunity to be faithful to the Lord. He is so faithful to us in your giving. If you need an envelope for your tithes or offering, please raise your hand. The ushers are going to make their way through the congregation. Keep in mind there are several ways to give. Um, you can use envelope if you like to use envelope. We also have a giving tab on the church website. While you're preparing your tithes and offering, would you please focus your attention on the announcements for tonight? Welcome. It's our pleasure to have each of you in service with us today. We'd like to share some upcoming events taking place here at the POK. Ladies Prayer takes place every Saturday at 10 a.m. Also, you can sign your family up for family prayer at the Next Steps booth in the foyer. On Friday, September 27th, the Spanish will be having a prayer meeting located in the Youth Sanctuary at 7.30. If you have any questions, please visit the Next Steps booth in the foyer. We hope to see you there. If you're a guest, we invite you to connect with us in the foyer at our Next Step booth. Once again, thank you for joining us this Sunday here at the Pentecostals. Amen. Would you stand to your feet with me, church? We want to also thank everybody from the Spanish ministry. Uh, we, uh, the Spanish ministry wants to thank everybody for uh, cooperating and, and being um, support to all the fundraisers that we had. We've had some great, great fundraisers. How many of y'all enjoyed that food that has been cooked by the Spanish ministry? It has been amazing. The only bad news that we have is there is no food for y'all tonight. But um, if you would, uh, ushers, come to the front, and would you pray with me to bless the offering? Lord God, use this for your kingdom, God. Multiply it, save a soul, God. Help us to plug into your will, your way, and what you're wanting to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Would you bring your tithes and offering to the Lord?
Are you glad you serve a God that's always by your side? He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Hallelujah. 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 No matter how deep the valley, no matter how wide the river, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will be by your side. I said, he will be by your side. He will take care of you. Hallelujah. His word promises he has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Oh, let's worship him one more time together. Amen. God bless you. Turn to the person beside you. Smile at them and say, I feel the presence of the Lord. Amen. And you can be seated. We want to take this opportunity to welcome our guests. If you're a first or second time guest here at the Pentecostals, you should have received a card on the way in. Amen. There are some gifts associated with that. We want you to have them. So if it's your first time or your second time and you didn't receive a card on the way in, lift your hand. The Yarsas will get that to you very quickly. First or second time guest. All right. I don't see any hands. Looks like we've got everyone covered. While we're thinking of it, and before we go any further, let's welcome our online audience. Those that are listening via Revival Radio, watching over the Internet, we love you. We pray this service blesses you tonight. Amen. Pentecostals, will you help me welcome our guests this evening? All right. I like that enthusiasm. All right. When I call your name or something that sounds like your name, just lift your hand so we can see where you're seated. We don't want to embarrass you, but we do want to recognize you and greet you. Amen. First time guest, Thomas Dorsey and family. Where are you seated at? Right here in the middle section. God bless you. We're so glad you're here. Amen. Great looking family. We're glad you folks are here. God bless you. Second time guest. I think I'm saying this right. Zariah Rock. Did I say that right? Rock. Where? Wave your hand. Oh, right over here on the right. God bless you. We're glad you're here. Amen. There she is. All right. Now we're going to put five minutes on the clock. And you have a chance to opportunity to go around this auditorium, greet everyone in this place, especially our guests. Let's stand together. Amen. Make your way around the auditorium. When the clock runs out, the music comes back up. Make your way back to your seats. God bless you. Amen.
the Lord good. I feel good in the Holy Ghost tonight. You're just going to have to excuse me. I, I just I just feel like shouting. I, there's times I come to church and I feel a deep moving a time. I feel a somber spirit, but tonight I just feel like shouting. God has been good. Hallelujah.
many know that our God is a miracle worker? There's nothing too hard for him. Whatever you come into this place dealing with tonight, whatever's been weighing you down, I encourage you to give it over to him because our God is a miracle worker and he's going to work in this house tonight. Signs and wonders We believe in your power We believe in your power The God of miracles Signs and wonders We believe in your power We believe in your power You're the God of miracles Signs and wonders
times Signs and wonders Believe in your power Believe in your power That you still serve the God of miracles Signs and wonders If there is anything that scripture bears out, it seems that, the Ma- that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all promote this idea concerning miracles. You'll find that most of the miracles that people received were not as a part of a larger group, but they were individuals in one way or another who broke out of the crowd and their hunger drove them 
while others in the crowd did not receive. These individuals pursued and obtained a miracle. Amen. I know there are many miracle needs in this place. There are many. I want to tell you that that miracle is not going to seek you out and just fall on. You've got to seek out that miracle. You've got to be willing to step out of the crowd and begin to pursue it and say, if anybody gets a miracle tonight, it's going to be me. You've got to be willing to cry when people, when people look at you like you're crazy and, and, and your hunger is driving you and you say, oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I wonder, is there anybody that wants a miracle bad enough that you'll become the subject of criticism for people around you? Take just a moment. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. I believe their hunger is stirred in this place tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands one more time. Come on. Let's not get in a hurry right now. The Holy Ghost is moving in this place. Come on, everybody praying. Everybody calling on the Lord. Oh, God, let your kingdom be established in this place today. Lord, let your kingdom rule. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. You have a thing that happens right now. Your control, your authority, your reign, your priorities. Lord Jesus, kingdom power is in this place right now. Oh God, kingdom power in this house right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, amen. Thank you, choir. God bless you. Let's put our hands together and let's thank the Lord for what he's doing in this place. Turn around to somebody beside you and tell them the spirit of the Lord is in this house. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place today. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Thank God for what we feel here tonight. And uh, we're going to move out of the way here in just a moment and call our preacher up. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. God is good. Amen. Hey, amen. I, I want to very briefly talk about something that's coming up, um, and, and we want to plan ahead for it. want to make sure that, um, that we are ready for it. It's still a few months out, but we need to start making plans. It's one of the biggest services that we have every year, and we call it All Nations Sunday, and it's coming up November the 10th. And uh, it's always just a, a, a tremendous, tremendous service, and the Lord moves. How many have been a part of our All Nation Sunday before? All right. Amen. Dr. Wilson said it's his favorite service of the year. Um, and uh, how many have never been a part of our All Nation? How about that? That might be better. All right. Thank you. Amen. Okay, so on All Nations Sunday, we're going to be, of course, celebrating all of the nations represented within our church. And we have quite a few represented within our, our, um, our congregation. But um, every year following service, we're dismissed. And we're, you know, we have samplings of food at different tables and, and uh, food from every nation. So if you're interested in all of that, make sure you put that on your calendar and plan on being here. Make sure you're not out of town on that weekend. It's November the 10th, no, Sunday, November the 10th. And it's, uh, it's just going to be a great service. I'm very excited. We have Brother Scott Graham that's going to be our preacher that, uh, that Sunday. And uh, how many remember the ministry of Brother Scott Graham? Amen. Only survivors hurt. I'll never forget that message. Just a powerful uh, a preacher of the gospel. He is the general secretary for the United Pentecostal Church. And, and I'm looking forward to his ministry back here. But it's just going to be a great, great day. So we want to start making plans for that. If you're interested, uh, just by a show of hands, how many here um, 
maybe you were, uh, you're, you're a resident here. I'm not, I'm not, this is not for the authorities. But uh, if you're, if you were not born here, just raise your hand. So don't worry. Nobody's watching. Okay. All right. You're born in a different country. All right. Just lift your hand. Or why don't we stand? Let's stand. Okay. Don't be nervous. Just stand. I was not born. I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. Okay, okay. Now, you may be seated. How many parents were from a different country, but you were born here? Okay, your parents were from a different country, but you were born here. All right? Okay, wonderful. You can put your hands down. Um, Okay, so on November 10th, we're going to be signing up for tables and uh, serving food, and we're we're working out the logistics of exactly how we're going to do it all, Uh, but we're going to make sure that, that we have plenty of room for great fellowship and it's just going to be a tremendous day. So just put that on your calendar and make sure that you are planning on, uh, on being a part of that. We want to get everybody signed up quickly and early this time. Uh, but I, um, I am so excited this evening for what God has, um, has been doing in our church. We've, we got to looking through our, um, all of our programs and even our leadership structure in the past I guess six months, there has been some significant changing and we've been moving and restructuring. Our Sunday school department has taken on a brand new life and and I'm very excited about that. We've divided it all up. We've got quite a few more teams involved in that. By the way, if you're interested in serving in Sunday school, uh, all you have to do is uh, contact uh, Sister Pamela Correa. If she's in here, just okay. She oops, there she is. Way up there with Brother Eutychus, Amen. Don't fall, Amen. But we're uh, we are. Eutychus was the guy that fell out, broke his neck. Sorry, it was a stretch. But uh, a- Amen. So just make sure you speak with her or Brother Soul Korea, and um, they can get you connected with the right department. The way that we have it set up is we've divided every weekend up into a to a different team. So basically, if you wanted to sign up for just one particular team, you'd serve once a month in a Sunday school uh, on a Sunday school ministry team. So it's very exciting. It's an easy way to serve in Sunday school for those that feel a burden for it, but don't necessarily feel like they can tackle it every week. We've got youth ministry um, or uh, preteen ministry that we have have just relaunched and uh, under the direction of Brother and Sister Scott and uh, very, very excited about what God is doing with all of that. Um, I probably should not have started uh, uh, Hyphen, yes, uh, the Brother and Sister Reynolds, thank you, uh, have taken over Hyphen Ministry and are doing a tremendous job. Don't stop there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, my wife said stop there, so I'll stop there. But... Um, Amen. So I'm very thankful for all of these, and I'm thankful for our youth department. And Brother and Sister Gage have done a tremendous job already with our youth, and our the, the, the services on Sunday morning have just been explosive. And I'm thankful for what God is doing in our youth department. Amen. Why don't we all stand together? It is, it is a great privilege and an honor. Um, I love working with a team. If you're new to the Pentecostals, this is not a one-man show or a two-man show or a three-man show. There's people literally uh, working every day of the week in ministry here, and, uh, and we rely on one another. It's a large team of ministers and, uh, and ministries, and so it, it's, it's fun working with a team. I believe it's, it's apostolic. I believe it's the will of God. Somebody say Amen. And I am thankful for each of these men that serve on, in, uh, in these positions. And I'm very thankful that God has placed a call upon their life to preach the word of the Lord. And I love variety. Y'all like variety? Amen. Now, well, nobody likes variety? Okay. You like variety? All right. It's, it's nice. You don't eat the same thing every night of the week. It just gets old after a while. And I love the variety that God has sent to our church in ministries. And I'm so thankful that God sent uh, Brother and Sister Gage to be a part of our family. And I'm looking forward to the Word of God tonight. He's going to be preaching the Word tonight. How many is going to help him preach? Amen. Now, we are a Pentecostal church. And in a Pentecostal church, the preacher never preaches alone. It's a team, it's a team sport. That means if he says something you agree with, you got to shout out amen and hallelujah. 
warm it up. Somebody shout, shout amen. The word amen means so be it. Amen. So be it. Amen. If, if, if he's talking about something you want to, to see happen in your life, just shout out amen. So be it in my life. Amen. Hallelujah. They say it means surrender. Amen. If there's some places you're feeling a little bit of conviction, just shout hallelujah. Throw your hands up in the air. There's something about receiving the word of God with a receptive, fertile heart. Amen. I want the word of God to make a difference in my life. Put your hands together and let's welcome our student pastor, youth pastor, Brother Justin Gage. God bless. Come on, let's give that to the Lord tonight. Come on, clap your hands and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on, somebody give Jesus some praise in this house. Come on, Lord, we worship you. We magnify you, Jesus. Hallelujah. What a privilege and an honor it is to be here in this pulpit, in this church, and under the ministry of my pastor, my executive pastor. I give honor to every minister that's here tonight. Like pastor said, you get variety. And tonight you're getting hamburger helper, so I hope you don't go home hungry. Because you can get full on hamburger helper too. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse number 1. How many of you like what we feel in this place already tonight? There is a powerful demonstration of the Holy Ghost that is present in this place. And there is absolutely no telling what God is going to do at the conclusion of this service. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, reading down through verse 11. says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit, everybody say of the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungry Everybody say hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up, and to the holy city, and set at him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou, da thou dash thy foot against a stone. Verse number 7 says, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse number 8, Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things Will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me? Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, or get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Verse number 11, the last scripture I'll read in your hearing tonight says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. For the next few moments of ministry, I just want to mention on this simple word, if. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, if. Now why don't you lay your Bibles to the side and let's go before the Lord tonight. And let's ask him to move in this place, Jesus. Lord, your word is anointed. 
I ask that you anoint these lips of clay tonight. Lord, I ask that your will be done in this house. Lord, I know what you have spoken to me. God, help me to communicate it to your people tonight with power and with authority. Let the power of the Holy Ghost, God, move in this service, God. I believe in you, Lord, that you are going to do great and mighty things in this house. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. You may be seated. You see, tonight we read in the book of Matthew where Jesus, right after in chapter 3, where the Spirit ascended on him like a dove and a light shone from heaven, the Father said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And at the beginning of the very next chapter, it says that it was the Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness for one purpose. And that purpose was for him to be tempted of the adversary. You see, so many of us go through trials and tribulations. And some of you tonight, I felt it in the Holy Ghost since I've been told that I was going to preach this, that so many of you are in a wilderness situation, not understanding tonight that it is not the devil who led you into the wilderness. It is not the devil tonight who led you into that dry place, but yet it was the Spirit, hallelujah. And the Spirit has a purpose for every valley and for every wilderness and for every low place that you may be going through tonight. I've come to remind somebody in this house that it is not the will of God that you die in your valley and in your wilderness, but God put you there for a purpose. And his purpose must be fulfilled before you come out of that wilderness. He was led into the wilderness on a 40-day fast. The Bible says that he was extremely hungry. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just fast breakfast and I'm extremely hangry. Not even hungry, I'm angry. I'm a tough person to deal with. With, when I'm hungry, my wife, I tell her sometimes I'm fasting. I just let her know ahead of time, you know. I might come home, and I might not be in the best mood. I'm really trying to get something from the Spirit, but I'm hungry, and I'm hangry. How many of you ever been there on a fast? Amen. Some of you didn't raise your hand because you don't fast. Amen. Watch out. I just tell you, it'll make a difference. But Jesus was in the wilderness on a 40-day fast. And the enemy came to him like he comes to so many of us where when we are in a vulnerable position. And he told him, he said, if you're really who you say that you are, why don't you turn these stones into bread? Let me just tell somebody in this house tonight, if the enemy is coming against you tonight with questions, If you really are called and chosen, if you really are anointed, then why in the world are you dealing with such sickness and chaos in your house? If you really are a child of God, why in the world is the enemy fighting you like this? If you really are chosen and called and God has a purpose for your life, why is it that your children are backsliding and you don't know what's going on with them tonight? Let me just tell you tonight that the enemy, since the very beginning, has operated through doubt and through fear and through questions. But I've come to tell you tonight, we need to have a made up mind that every time the enemy comes in like a flood, you need the Spirit of the Lord to raise up a standard and you You need to let the enemy know that I have made up my mind. You will not tempt me. You will not try me. And you will not have victory in my life. Amen. But just like the enemy, he just kept coming. How many of you have ever told the devil to get out of there and he just left? Amen. It's happened sometimes, but it usually don't happen on the first try. Amen. 
Sometimes that devil just keeps knocking at the door. He keeps trying to bring questions and doubt in your mind. Hey, if you really are called, what's going on? Why isn't God helping you? Is the Holy Ghost really necessary? Is this really the right church for you? Do you really believe everything that's preached? Is all of that really necessary to be saved? Let me just tell you that when the enemy begins to raise that doubt up in your mind, you don't need to read another blog. You don't need to read another secular book. You need to go to the Word of God, and you need to put the Word of God on the enemy, and it'll put him on the run every single time. Hallelujah. And that's exactly what the Lord did. You see, some of you tonight have come into the house of God. And the enemy has convinced you that God does not know where you are. That God does not understand your struggles and the things that you're going through. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. You serve a God this morning or this evening who put on flesh and came down and dwelt among us. He knows exactly what you're going through, child of God. He sees exactly what you are being tempted with, but yet he has provided a way of escape through the power of the Holy Ghost and through the word of God. You see, some of us think that because we are being tempted and we are being tried, that God has forsaken us. The enemy would love to whisper into your ears tonight that because you are fighting certain things and certain things are rising up against your ministry, your household, and your anointing, that God has forsaken you and that he has turned his back on you. But that is a lie from the enemy. You need to get yourself in your Bible. You need to be faithful to the house of God. You need to cleave to your pastor. And you need to remind the enemy that there is nothing that can destroy me. Devil, I may be tempted. I may be tried. But I am anointed. I am a child of God. God has a call on my life. And there is a purpose for every temptation that I am facing. Clap your hands unto the Lord. But you see, the enemy's slick. He just keeps using the same old ignorant things, hoping that we're going to fall prey to it. Amen? That's why so many people in the church get hurt and walk away from God. God, if that was really the place that I needed to be, you'd have done something. You'd have stepped in. God, if I'm really called... If I'm really chosen, why in the world would you have allowed that to happen to me? You need to understand tonight that hurt and pain and struggle and sacrifice and diverse temptations are all a part of living for God. It does not make you, come on somebody, you hear me tonight. Some of you, the enemy has pushed you into a corner and he's ready to make a kill punch to you and your and your life and your anointing because you have believed the voice that is telling you that God does not care about you and God does not know where you are. But you better make up your mind tonight that I am not leaving here hurt. I'm not leaving here torn apart. I am leaving here whole I'm going to be reminded in this house that though he slay me yet will I trust him and that no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper you see Jesus time and time the devil came unto him tempting him offering him all kind of things Let me just stop and tell someone today that the pleasures of sin and everything that the enemy is offering you may last for a season, just a season, just a moment. But you're going to wake up on the other side of eternity and you're going to live in a a place called hell with a belly full of regret and you're going to remember everything that you gave up that was in this house. And everything that you walked away from, it only lasted for a season. And you're going to have eternity to deal with that guilt 
and that pain. But you see, Jesus, he kept putting the devil on the run with the word. And it worries me that we are raising a word-ignorant generation. Don't take offense to that, please. Last Sunday morning, we had 82 in youth service. And I rejoiced for that. We were bringing chairs out. People were standing up. We had a powerful time. God's doing great things in our young people. But sometimes, some of the only word that we get is on Sunday and Wednesdays. I looked across the congregation, pastor, and only two kids had their Bible. Which tells me that if you struggle dragging it to church on Sunday, are you really picking it up on Monday? You see, the reason that Jesus was able to quote Scripture back at the devil and defeat him and put him on the run is because he knew it. I read nowhere in the book of Matthew where he had to go to his Bible app or to Google and say, what should I respond to that? It worries me. When I was coming up, we had things called sword drills. And no, we did not fight with real swords. Some of you who are against violence, don't worry. But we would bring our Bibles to church. I remember as a young person being embarrassed, Brother Harris, when I did not have my word with me. When I was a child coming up, we were encouraged to read the word of God, not to watch Netflix, not to play video games, not to dabble in all kind of foolishness. We were encouraged to read the word of God. Mom and dad, let me just tell you real quick. If you want your teenager to graduate from high school and walk with God and continue to have a relationship with God, you better push them towards this book. I know it's not popular and you're not going to win a popularity contest, but they better get some knowledge of this book so that when the devil comes, they have the knowledge to defeat him every single time that he roars his ugly head. Make your children get into the word of God. My parents wouldn't have forced me. That's right, I said forced. I've got a seven-year-old, and when I force him to do things, it does not make me very popular. But guess what? God didn't give me children to be their favorite and to be their best friend. He gave me children so that I could lead them and guide them and raise a sixth generation of apostolic believers. And there's no way in the world that it's going to happen if we neglect the Word of God. Some of you wonder why the enemy is fighting your homes and your marriage and everything that you've got going on. When was the last time that you opened the Word of God in your house? Somebody clap your hands and shout unto God. He defeated him with a word. It works every time. When I'm confused, pastor, when I need direction, when I don't know what to do, when I don't have the answers, when I don't understand why the enemy is coming against me, it's amazing that when I get out this book, I can go to the right scripture and I can read the right thing and the book begins to minister to me and it gives me strength to be a father. It gives me strength to be a minister. It gives me strength to be a leader in my home. Daddy, you need to go home and you need to get out the book. You need to cancel Little League or whatever else you're doing that's keeping your family out of the book. You need to get off of whatever television or internet that you're on or your smart phone and you need to get in the word of God amen I'm sorry for some of you that's strong meat and I apologize but it worries me this smartphone generation where everything we have is at our fingertips and as a parent, it's so easy just to send them up to their room, go watch something, leave me alone, I've had a bad day, I, I don't have time for this right now. 
But God convicted me of something a few months ago. And he convicted me about every night of the week we've got something going on, Sister McKee. So I'm trying to make it to where one night a week we get down and we study this word. I was so amazed. My son started reading in the book of Psalms, or as he calls it, Psalms. And I asked him just to read one chapter, and he was so mad. He wanted to watch Netflix or something, you know, play a video game. And I was amazed, Brother Harris, that he read one chapter, and then I looked over, and he just kept reading. He just kept reading. 45 minutes had gone by, he just kept reading. And he was telling me some of the things that he read. And he was telling me some of the things. Man, Dad, did you know this happened? Mom and Dad, let me tell you, if you want to defeat the enemy in your home, If you've got a devil that's in your house that's messing with your children, I encourage you tomorrow night, why don't you shut the television off at 8 o'clock and say we're going to spend one hour in the Word as a family. Let me tell you, you're going to notice a difference. You're going to notice an immediate difference. Amen. But not only did he defeat him with the Word, Jesus understood that it was the Spirit that carried him into the wilderness. So many of us tonight are in a dark and a dry place spiritually. Families going through all kind of hell, sickness breaking loose, all kind of mess going on. And we are so frustrated at the devil and at everybody else that we refuse to realize that the steps of a good man are ordered of God. And if you are in a dark place or in a wilderness or a valley tonight, you need to understand that God has you there for a reason. Come on, I said there's a purpose to it. The children of Israel spent 40 years on the backside of a desert while God tried to get something out of them and to put something into them. Every single trial and tribulation is approved by God that comes into your life. Stop frustrating your faith, threatening to quit coming to church, getting a bitter and a bad attitude and realize that God knows exactly where I am. He knows the hairs that are on my head and my God has a plan for this season of my life. Come on, I said it's the Spirit that's led you into that wilderness tonight. You see, you've got to realize that that wilderness is meant to deepen your devotion and your dedication unto Almighty God. That trial and that situation that you are facing is not for no reason, but God is trying to do something in your life that you're going to look back on someday and you're going to say, man... I didn't like it then, but man, it was for my good. You see, some of us think that the wilderness ought to be full of pumpkin spice lattes and chicken wings and Chick-fil-A and Papacitos on Friday. It should be full of all these good things. Amen? But I can tell you, young people, that any dark place that I've ever walked through, any trial, any tribulation that I've ever gone through hasn't been pleasant. Amen? But you hear me, it's my attitude on how I acted in that trial that determined just how quickly I received deliverance from that wilderness. You see, so many people walk through wilderness situations and dark places and they refuse to leave because they have a sorry attitude. Amen? You're mad at the church, you're mad at the pastor, you're mad at God. And the only time that you pray to him is when you pray in anger. On God, why am I going through this? God, why did you allow this to happen to me? God, why is the devil on my trail tempting me and trying me? Come on, but you've got to realize God is more concerned with your holiness than he is your happiness. God is more interested in developing your character than he is in your comfort. God is more interested and 
reaching down into your life and doing something great than he is you being happy and being proud all the time of what you're going through. God is trying to do something in you. Amen. Can't tell you that every day that I've had serving the Lord has been a happy day, Brother Mayor. Can't tell you that every trial that I've gone through, I've understood it. There are things that I've gone through just the past year that I might not understand until eternity. But guess what? I've made up my mind. I'm not going to let my bad attitude and my bitter spirit, I'm not going to let it come into my house because guess what? It takes root in your children. Come on, and it takes root in your family. But I've made up my mind that I am going through this trial and this tribulation and this dark place, and I'm going to do it with a good attitude. Because you hear me tonight, if you're not prepared, the wilderness will kill you. It will. God has a plan and a purpose for the wilderness, but so does the devil. Don't you ever doubt it. You see, the wilderness will absolutely destroy you if you don't have a knowledge of the Word of God. The wilderness will destroy you, Dr. Wilson, if you're not connected to your pastor and to the church. The wilderness will destroy you if you continue to blame everybody else for what you're going through. My Bible tells me that though we may walk through dark valleys, but that it is in the valley that he restoreth my soul. It is in the valley, it is in those low places that God does something great on the inside of me. I've made up my mind that I'm going through whatever wilderness it is that the Lord places me in. And I'm going to do it with a smile on my face even when I don't feel like smiling. You see, my family and I came here almost 18 months ago. And I'll be very transparent when I tell you that we walked into this place messed up. I was frustrated. I was downtrodden. The night before we came here, I told my wife, I said, I ought to mail in my ministerial license and just hang it up. I said, I can't do this anymore. I don't understand this trial. I don't understand why God would do this. I don't understand why God would let me walk through this. I've been faithful in giving. I've been faithful in attendance. And I've been faithful in everything that I've done. I don't understand why God would allow me to go through this. And I can remember I walked in here on a Sunday morning and I remember what you preached. And I came down to this altar so broken. And Pastor McKee, I didn't need to stick six. I was stuck and you're not getting rid of me. And I'd like to tell you that things got better in that moment. But they didn't. For the next year, my wife and I walked through one of the darkest valleys that I've ever been through in my life. I faced things that I thought I slayed years ago. The enemy began to attack my mind and my ministry. And if that wasn't enough, he began to attack my marriage and my business and my children. He began to attack every single thing that I had my hands on. And I was frustrated. I'll just be honest with you, I was mad at the Lord. It got to be where I'd come to church, then I wouldn't want to go to the altar. The enemy had a foothold in my mind, and he had me convinced, like he has some of you, that what difference does it make? It got so bad. I started missing Wednesday nights, justifying it with work and young kids. Then I started missing Sunday nights, Pastor. And then when I would come on Sunday mornings, you'd call for ministry and I'd duck out the back door to go to the nursery. Because I was doubting if I was really called, if I was really anointed. And if I was, how in God's name 
was all of this chaos that was in my life. All right. How in the world could God allow some of the things that I was facing to go on? I began to work so hard in my business. I was having to work during the day, 12, 14 hours. I'd come home and I'd put my kids to bed at night. I'd leave back out of the house again at 9 o'clock at night. I'd work all night. I was running on two, three hours of sleep. That was it. Trying to make things work. I was frustrated in my faith. But every time I'd come here on Sunday and the pastor would preach and the choir would sing, and people would minister, I'd feel like God saying, yeah, I do have a plan for you. And yes, you are called. But the if that the enemy had planted in my mind, like he's planted in so many of your minds tonight, was saying, yeah, God, if that's true, then why am I going through this? Yeah, God, I know that you say that there's an anointing there, but when I pray, I don't feel you. I know that you say that you're going to do something great, but I don't see it. The Bible tells us that we have to walk by faith, Pastor, and not by sight. And I can remember the Sunday morning just a few months ago, and I was sitting back there where Brother Scott's sitting, and you had preached a word, and it messed up my heart, and I was broken. And I knew in my heart what I needed to do, Pastor. But like so many times before, the ifs had taken control of my mind. And I was saying, God, if that message was for me, if there really is something still left, how? And God spoke to me sitting right back there and He said, if you walk out today, He said, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. He told me, he said, I have an anointing on you. He said, I have a purpose for you. And I can remember I turned around right there. I wasn't worried with who was getting the kids out of the nursery. I wasn't worried with what else was going on. And I made my way down to this altar. And God renewed me in the Holy Ghost. And God touched me. And God reminded me, I've come to preach to somebody tonight that the ifs are taking over your mind. And the questions you have, you don't understand why it is that you're walking through so many situations it is that you're going through. Every time that altar call is made, you stay where you are, you go home. Because the enemy's telling you, if everything that he's preaching really is for you, then why don't you feel it? then why don't you see it? And to the enemy I say, I'm not walking today by what I feel because this thing ain't based on feeling. It's based on faith. It's based on the radical faith that my God's call is without repentance and that if He has called you once before in this house, that there is a call of God on your life tonight and it will never go away. No matter where you run, no matter where you go, no matter what you tell yourself, no matter what the enemy tells yourself, there is a call on your life and there is a purpose for you. Clap your hands unto the Lord. Hey, First Corinthians chapter 10 verse number 13 says that there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You see, every minister on this platform, every person in this house is dealing with temptation of some sort. You don't ever pray enough, fast enough to where you are not tempted. 
Some of you, the enemy has convinced you that because you are tempted and because you are tried, that you are not a child of God and that there is no anointing. But now there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I've come to tell somebody tonight that if you want to dump that condemnation in your life, you need to do what I did a few Sunday mornings ago and you need to make that about face and you need to turn around and stop walking in the flesh and stop walking in worldliness and walk in the Spirit. Make up your mind that I am coming out of this wilderness with a greater anointing, with a greater passion, and with something greater than I ever imagined. Amen, amen. And the next thing I noticed, and I'll be closing here in a moment, that Jesus did was when the devil came to him the third time, he didn't use conflict resolution or whatever they teach you kids in school today. My son came home a few months ago, told me some kid messed with him. And my response was, well, did you knock him out? Because I was raised in a house that if you didn't stand up for yourself, you had a whipping waiting on you when you came home. Ain't that right, Dad? Because my dad didn't mind if you fought and lost, you better at least put up a good fight. <laughs> Conflict resolution. But that's, that's, that's how some of us deal with the devil in our life. Let me just break it down for you real quick. That's, some of, that's how some of you mess around and deal with the devil. Well, devil, I'll give you my praise if you let me have my prayer life. Come on. Yeah, I'll stay in this wilderness a, long, a little bit longer. I'm going to keep my bad attitude, and yeah, you can have this. Let me just tell you tonight, the devil hadn't come to do anything but to steal, to kill, and destroy. You can't negotiate with somebody like that. You need to tell the devil, get thee behind me, Satan. You have no authority in my life. I refuse to give you an inch and much less a mile. Get thee behind me, Satan. Hallelujah. But some of us come in here, service after service, and we negotiate with the enemy. When the Lord has given you power and authority and dominion to kick him square out your life. Amen. Where is the fight in the apostolic church anymore, Dr. Wilson? We've resorted to measures of conflict resolution like they teach in these crazy schools. I told my son, I said, you know what? I said, the next time that boy messes with you, I said, you better lay him out. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Some of you that are anti-violence, you go home and you believe that. <laughs> but when the burglar breaks in your house, I'm sure you ain't going to be trying to talk it out with them. Oh, yeah. Amen. And some of you wonder why the enemy's got a foothold in your family. It's because you are anti-violent when it comes to the enemy. And you don't want to fight with him. I don't want a confrontation. Well, honey, I've come to tell you tonight that I do want a confrontation. I want to kick him out of our families. I want to kick him out of our churches. I want to kick him out of our ministries. I want to kick him off of your anointing. I want the devil gone. Get thee behind me, Satan. Hallelujah. Clap your hands unto the Lord. So they teach in my son's school. We don't know how it is in Cypher. We hadn't got any fights there. We've been from Magnolia, you know. Just a bunch of hillbillies. But they teach in my son's school that it's equal punishment for the person that starts the fight and the one that reacts to it. That kind of sounds a lot like the trick that the enemy is playing on your minds. You see, when the tempter came to Jesus, he wasn't worried about the repercussions, Pastor. 
He wasn't worried about the punishment. He wasn't worried about that if I tell the devil to get out of here, well, what's the devil going to come back and do? Because we don't want to make the devil mad. And some of us wonder why we never get true victory and why we can't get a reprieve from the enemy attacking our life. Is oh, we don't want to stir up the devil. Let me just tell you something, honey. You are an apostolic child of the Most High God. The devil is stirred up at you already. But some of you who live in this Laodicean mentality, that's why the devil doesn't mess with you. But some of you who have a call and you have an anointing on your life and you have potential, that is why the devil keeps on attacking your purpose. So you can't negotiate with him. You can't allow those questions to rise in your mind. It was a few months ago that my wife and I, we made up our mind that where we were spiritually after that Sunday morning, if we kept on that path, I told you that at lunch one day. I told you, I said, I've drifted further than I ever imagined. That's the thing about not being anchored to something and just drifting. Because you see, if Jesus would have relented to any temptation of the devil, he wouldn't have walked into Capernaum and into Galilee and seen many miracles. He wouldn't have died for you and for me on that cross. You see, some of you need to realize tonight that the reason that you are facing great trials and tribulations and you are living in a wilderness maybe as of this moment it's because God has something greater on the other side that you're not going to understand until glory and He's going to fulfill it if you can just hold on. Come on, I said if you can just hold on. My God is going to do it for you. But Brooke and I made up our mind. We're not going to keep doing this. It ends today. We didn't take a family vote. We made the decision. It ain't happening no more. No mas. Not going to allow it. Called my dad one Saturday. I said, hey, I'm going to sell my house. I said, I got to get, clo get closer to the church. My dad was like, okay. All right. I lived about three miles from my office. That's part of the problem. I lived at the office, and I worship my business more than I worship God. Some of you come into here and you wonder why God ain't blessing your finances. Let me tell you, seek ye first the kingdom of God, not finances, not riches, not business or whatever you think you're about to turn that into because it's never going to amount to anything until you put him first. My dad said, okay. And in true fashion, I picked a house that was kind of in the middle. It's like, well, we'll get, you know, we're closer, you know, we're a little bit closer. Well, I put my house on the market. The house that Brooke and I just sold was our dream house. Thought we were going to be there forever. Wouldn't you know it, the house wouldn't sell. Amen. Kept dropping the price. I kept telling the Lord, if it's your will, it's your bill. You told me to do this, I'm trying to get closer. And I felt like the Lord said, you ain't getting close enough. So nothing would work. Everything was falling through. Three falling through, two or three falling through contracts. That's annoying and aggravating. And then my wife and I drove to Bridgeland one Saturday. I said, I'm just going to show you some houses. That was a mistake, Dr. Wilson. Because, of course, we didn't like the little smaller houses. She liked the bigger houses, amen? And I'd be lying if I said I didn't too. Sometime you need some space from your three kids, Amen. But it was going to mean that I was going to have a further drive to work. I was going to be far away from my whole operation. A lot of our work is farther north. And God convicted me about the time that I started questioning me. He said, how far will you drive to go make a buck? You work all night, drive five, six hours just to go to a meeting, you know? And I said, all right, Lord. I said, if it's your will, I want you to work it out. And this morning, 
I woke up in a house 15 minutes from here that God blessed me and my family with because I was willing to get radical. I was willing to realize that that wilderness, there was a blessing on the other side of it, that God had a purpose for the, all those falling through contracts. God had a purpose for everything that I went through. And let me just tell you this, last Sunday night, pastor gave us one of these towels. Maybe these don't mean anything to you. But I saw this today when I was coming back from the coffee shop from studying. And the Lord said, that right there is a trophy in the hands of the Lord. And the Lord told me, he said, because 18 months ago, he said, you were headed to hell. He said, your ministry was a mess. He said, the enemy sought to destroy you. He said, that right there is a trophy. And I'll tell you this right now. Some of you tonight who are walking through a wilderness, you don't understand why God is allowing everything to happen to you. But let me tell you, there's a trophy on the other side of this. You're going to stand up here someday and pastor's going to hand you a towel. Come on. And you're going to look back. And you're going to say, I walked in here hurting. I walked in here a failure. I walked in here making mistakes. But look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. So I've come to encourage someone tonight who is being tempted and who is being tried. I feel a spirit of restoration in the house tonight. I feel that God wants to restore some of you who have been given towels, but you've backed out of ministries and you've backed out of callings because of life's circumstances and because of valleys that you're walking through. I've come to remind you tonight that the call of God is without repentance. You need to get back in your word. You need to tell Satan, get thee behind me, Satan. You need to do something crazy because I'm gonna tell you there is a blessing. There is an anointing. There is something deep and there is something great on the other side of that wilderness. You see, it was that wilderness that propelled Jesus' ministry forward all the way to the cross. It was that wilderness that prepared him for what was to happen next. Just a few verses later, he meets Simon Peter. And God puts somebody in his life that's instrumental in the first church. Let me just tell you, when you start walking with God, when you start getting the devil behind you, God is going to put people in your life and God is going to put things in motion in your life. But he is looking for somebody who will get the devil behind them and say, you know what? Though you slay me, I'm still going to trust you. I'm still going to be faithful to the house of God. I'm still going to be faithful to my pastor. Though I don't understand it, though I don't see it, though I don't feel it, I am still going to be faithful stand across this building tonight I truly believe that we are living in the last days I believe that the enemy is at work in families in ministries and in every area child of God that you will give him room in I got to thinking today where I would be and where my family would be if it wasn't for these two people right here in this church I don't know where I would be without this place. This place has been one of the greatest miracles that God has ever allowed to take place in my life. Never forget, Brother Mayor, you had a Wednesday night class after I first started coming here. And it was for preachers only, and I went up there 
and I talked to you a little bit about my past experience. You said, oh, my Lord, man, what are you doing on the sidelines? you got to get involved. And I was thinking, man, if you only knew. And that's how some of you are thinking right now. If you only knew. You're saying, put the devil behind me. You're saying, walk in authority. You don't even know. But I want you to hear me tonight. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says, chapter 30, I believe it says, This day I call heaven and earth to record against you. Blessing, cursing, life or death. And this isn't in my notes, but I feel that that's the moment that we are in right now. There's some of you that are walking through a wilderness situation. And I believe that God has called this day to record against every one of you. And myself included. And he's looking at the ones who are going to allow their circumstances at this altar call to cause you to go deal with your children out back, to stay in your pew, to not move, to be lethargic and lukewarm and go home in the same state that you came here in like I did for many months. But just know, saint of God, that in eternity, you may not remember what I preached today or what pastor preached this morning, but every message is going to play on a reel in your mind if you don't make it to heaven. And you're going to look back like I did. Think of every missed opportunity. Every time I turned away and said, surely, he's asking for preachers to come pray. I don't feel like a preacher today. He's asking for people to come forward. Surely he's not talking to me. But I believe that God has called heaven and earth to record against us today. God's looking for somebody that's going to respond and say, you know what, God? I'm in a wilderness situation. I'm battling if all this is necessary. If everything that we teach here is really real. If I really belong here in this church. And God is looking and saying, come into me. All ye who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Because Sister McKee, when I finally made myself come down to this altar and I finally surrendered, I went home that night, Dr. Wilson, and I slept like I hadn't slept in months. Because the enemy was not relenting on my mind and on my family and on my marriage. I come tonight as a merchant of hope telling you that if you are in a wilderness, that there is hope for you in this altar. If you want to put the devil on the run, that you can do it right here. If the enemy has attacked your marriage and your ministry, that it's in this place and in this altar that God is going to restore unto you what the locusts have taken and the palmer worm and everything else. He kandario norobo satayala baha. He shandario norobo siyanala baha. Come on, that's it. Lift your hands all across this building. Get thee behind me, Satan. I have a calling. I have an anointing. I'll say
Amen. Thank the Lord. God just filled Zaria with the baptism of the Holy Ghost the very first time. Thank the Lord. Great things are happening. Amen. I thank God for what he's doing for those that are praying. You want to continue to pray. God bless you. Remember our services this week. But thank God for his word tonight. Amen. How many, how many felt like you received a word from the Lord tonight? Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Gage. I, I appreciate that word of the Lord. Thank God for what he is speaking to his church. And he cares about us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. Remember all of our announcements for this week. Remember our service this Wednesday night. And we're going to have a great, great Wednesday night service. And thank God for all that he is doing. Be back here again next Sunday for another great breakthrough. Amen. Brother Gage talk, talked about one thing, and I, I want to touch on that. It's been a long time since we've talked about the importance of family night. And I, I think it's, it's good for us to, to bring it up ever, ever so often. We need to reestablish family night in our church. And family night, just for those that are unfamiliar, it's not just hanging out spending time with your family. But what we ask is that you take at least, uh, you know, at least 30 minutes and sit down with your family and the Bible, talk about a Bible story, lesson, and just have a conversation with your family. I know we all get busy. I'm, I'm as guilty as everyone else and get busy about doing our own thing. But we need family time, and we need family time around the Word of the Lord. So I want to encourage you this week, and we're going to, uh, we're going to talk more about this to, to revive our family night. Take 30 minutes and spend time uh, in the Word of the Lord with your family. It's a challenge with young kids. Trust me. I was, I'm the dad of Savannah, McKenna, and Sophia. And they, it's hard to rain. Last, it's like herding cats when you're trying to teach them. And, uh, but I, I encourage you to, to spend time in the Word with your kids. 30 minutes. And then after 30 minutes, then take another 30 minutes and play a game. It doesn't involve video. Take a, play a game and talk to your kids. Have a good meal before or after. And uh, let, let's, let's bring our families back to that place where we all love God and we're all serving the Lord together. Amen. Thank you so much again, Brother Gage, for that word tonight. I feel like God ministered in a very deep way to many, many people. This is a life-changing night for some folks. And so, amen. Thank God for that word. And uh, amen. God bless you. Why don't you take a few moments. Oh, we have somebody to be baptized. That's wonderful. Thank the Lord for that. That's exciting. God is so good. Amen. Thank the Lord for what he is doing. And uh, amen. We serve a great God. A great, great God. Amen. Take a few moments and hug three or 4,000 people's necks. Let them know that you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord. Amen. You're dismissed in the fear of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord.